Hi, I'm Chris Gensmer, and I'm going to be discussing the airway review for PALS. Now, American Heart Association is very big into definitions, and the thing they want you to be able to define is the difference between distress and failure. Distress is defined as any time our patients have difficulty breathing. If your pediatric patient can't catch their breath, they are tachypneic, they aren't breathing quite enough or effectively, at that point we want to do a further evaluation. And a good evaluation for respiratory distress starts with a good set of lung sounds. We want to make sure that we're listening to lungs early and often. During and after treatments will also be very helpful for our patients and helpful to see that we're doing the right thing for our patients. Now, if all patients who are having difficulty breathing are in distress, when does it become failure? So respiratory failure is defined in two ways by American Heart Association. And the first one is that your O2 saturations remain below 94% despite oxygenation. So I've administered oxygen via nasal cannula, via um, non-rebreather mask, and despite that, they still are below 94% they are now in respiratory failure and we need to start taking care of it to fix whatever the problem is. The other definition of failure is going to be any time we feel the need to administer rescue breathing. If we decide to grab this and start breathing for our patient, at that point we consider them to be in failure because their respiratory effort is no longer effective. When we're helping our patients, we mentioned oxygenation already through nasal cannula or non-rebreather. So if we're going to grab those, our nasal cannula, it's advised to do that between two to four liters per minute nasally. If that is no longer effective at four, then we're going to jump all the way up to the non-rebreather mask. Non-rebreather mask, we're going to be doing at 10 to 15 liters per minute. With that, you need to make sure you have a good regulator, you have to make sure your oxygen is full and that we're maintaining that oxygenation and re-evaluating lung sounds and SpO2 after administration of oxygen. If the breathing gets bad enough, at that point we wanna start considering the patency of our patient's airway. The patency is going to be maintained if they're unconscious or if we're breathing for them through adjuncts. The adjuncts of choice of course, are going to be your OPA and your NPA. So with the OPA, the oropharyngeal airway, this one we wanna make sure that we size correctly for our patients. This is going to be that nice rigid one that goes right through the mouth into the back of the throat. And so we're going to measure from the corner of the mouth to the turn of the jaw. If it fits right in there, then at that point, we know it's not going to be occluding the tongue by going too far and curving back up. And we also know that it's not gonna to be too shallow pushing the tongue down into the back of the oral pharynx. If we wanna go on from OPA, we can instead put in an NPA, nasopharyngeal airway. With these, we're gonna be measuring from the opening of the nair to the tip of the ear. Now, when we administer these, we typically start with the left nostril, but you can go left or right depending on patient needs. And we're gonna be going to one of these immediately if we notice that the oral has a gag reflex of any sort. This will bypass that gag reflex. You won't have that problem with your patient. So once we've measured, we're going to go bevel towards the septum inside of the nose. Make sure you lube up your NPAs. We never put in a dry NPA. And then as we push it past the nair, we flatten it out and we go at a 90 degree angle straight into the nose. The nasal passage doesn't go up it goes straight back. So if you ride the top of it, you run the risk of increasing bleeding through the nasal passages, and then you have a little bit more of a mess on your hands. Speaking of mess on your hands, we also wanna make sure that we have suction ready at all of these points. If we have an OPA and they start uh, vomiting, then we wanna have our mobile suction or our wall-mounted suction, and we're going to be suctioning our patient using either a rigid catheter or a soft catheter um, if they happen to have an ET tube or an advanced airway. But no matter what device we use, we want to insert suction on the way out and make sure that we're not doing it for any more than 10 seconds at a time, and then improve oxygenation and ventilation in between each attempts to suction out whatever we're trying to retrieve from the patient's throat. Now breathing for our patient, breathing becomes very important for our unconscious patients and for our patients in cardiac arrest. And we need to make sure that we're doing good rescue breathing if they're unconscious. 
Rescue breathing is one breath every three to five seconds for our pediatric patients. Each breath should take approximately one second, and you should only be giving enough breath until you have chest rise. So what really matters at this point is having the right size BVM. It's very, very easy to give every pediatric patient too much air with a pediatric bag. The tidal volume in this far surpasses our average pediatric patient. So if you see too much chest rise with it, if you see too much coming out, you might need to go to a smaller size or just make sure that you're only using two fingers on the bag only until you have that chest rise. Down the line as we're breathing for our patients, if their airway really isn't working effectively, some of you might be able to administer advanced airways. So the advanced airways that we give are typically going to be superglottic airways for an emergent quick setting. This will include what's pictured, which is the eye gel. Eye gel is nice, simple insertion. You lube it up, ride the back of the mouth, goes in, sets nicely. Uh, the sizes are right on them and it shows you how big the patient should be compared to the eye gel. Other ones include your LMAs, your King Airways. Uh, there are different objects and types of airways that will be coming out and that have come out, so use whatever's within your scope of practice. Beyond that, the next step is of course going to be our intubation. So when we grab the endotracheal tube, these are going to be cuffed for our patients and making sure that we have the proper size and depth for our patient without main stemming left or right. As far as practicing for this goes, it's not part of PALS, but if it's within your scope of practice and we have the ability to provide it for you, let us know so that you can get a little hands-on with some of these devices. When we have an airway, we're presumably bagging for our patient. If they're in cardiac arrest, we need to make sure that we're doing the best we can for our patient and really making sure that we get preload to the heart. And so something we add to the airway section actually helps with preload and cardiac output during CPR, which is the rescue pod. This is an impedance threshold device. It's currently the only impedance threshold device on the market. And we apply this anytime a patient's in cardiac arrest. And as we do compressions, specifically when we're decompressing, so during the decompression phase, this increases the amount of space that the heart can expand, which increases the negative pressure of blood back to the heart. We wanna have this on our patients anytime they're in cardiac arrest, typically if they're one year of age or older or 10 kilograms or older. Some hospitals and some departments may vary from that. That is the uh, standard of care for most of our patients is one year or 10 kilograms. Remember, of course, when you finish with a rescue pod, that we are also supposed to remove this once you get ROSC of your patient. So once you get a pulse back, once you get spontaneous respirations, make sure that this gets removed immediately. Another adjunct that we can use, an assessment tool that we have, is going to be our end title. Now, end titles can come in a few different ways. Um, early on, if the patient is still breathing on their own, we have smart cannulas, and these smart cannulas will be able to evaluate a lot of things like respiratory drive, respiratory rate, and also the compliance of the lungs as they're expelling their carbon. And then the one that we're going to see very commonly, especially during cardiac arrest, is going to be our inline filter. The inline filter fits directly with our BVM, and it fits directly on top of the rescue pod. So with these, we're gonna be looking for a normal wave for our patients. Pictured here is a normal, uh, normal end tidal wave. The waveform capnography shows us that nice compliance of the lungs. We're looking for a good number, 35 to 45 for our average patient. The end tidal shows us many different things. One very common thing to look for is going to be asthma in our patients or that bronchoconstriction. And so we can look for this typical shark fin that comes with our patients with a asthmatic response. With these, we're going to breathe for our patients, but we might want to administer some medications like a nebulizer with them. Other things that your end title are going to do is it shows you the efficiency and the effectiveness of your CPR. So if that number is below 35 and it keeps dropping and dropping and dropping, the first thing you need to do when doing CPR in a patient is maximize your CPR. 
Maximize that to see if that number of the end title starts rising. You also might see a very large leap in that end title number right before and as you get ROSC on your patient. It's the body resetting and restarting, blowing off a whole bunch of carbon, like a small engine starting that blows off smog in the spring after it's been sedentary all winter. The body's doing something similar as it comes back and breathes life back into the patient. Those are the main devices, main airway and pathophysiology behind some of that. If you have any questions, please ask one of your instructors. We're gonna be going into a breakout session now, and in this, we want you to practice the OPA, the NPA. Make sure we're maintaining that two-handed seal with the BVM at all times. Practice your rescue breathing, one second breaths, one every three to five seconds. And then optional, you might be able to play with a superglottic airway or an end title, practice with those as you can. Thank you for your time.